Good morning, Jason. How are you doing today? Arrow Collins, how are you this morning? I'm doing absolutely fantastic, and I, I, I'm, I'm probably not the only one that's going to tell you this, but the very second that you, you, you finish up with uh, Sir Mix-a-Lot, you go back and you watch the video, and, and you have a whole completely different vibe about the presence of that song as well as that video. Yep. It's so true. It's so true. And the thing is, like, you know, I uh, was... I was very, very, very young when that video came out. I didn't have access to, to MTV at that point. We, our cable providers were very, very religious, very conservative, yep. and they wouldn't allow it in our town. Yep. So <laughs> what was really interesting was I had not seen, I had seen clips of that video as a kid, right? Just through like news stories and um, just it surfacing on talk shows or whatever, but I had never seen the full video full video until I went back to research for the show, if you can believe it, all these years later, and was just blown away by just how crazy and silly and innuendo packed it was, but also like, you know, really smart. And then, you know, I did the same thing you did. I, after speaking to Mix and to Adam Bernstein, the director, I went back and visit, you know, I, I kept revisiting it, obviously, as I was, as I was writing it and 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 finding the almond, the model at the center of it all, the first the first black woman you see in the video, and yeah, I had a I had a I had a greater appreciation for it um, as well. It 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 has a it has sort of a um, a camp value, yes. but it also yeah, was pretty clever. Well, I didn't realize that it was supposed to be a parody or a comedy piece, but when I go back and I listen to the lyrics now that I've heard your your podcast, I mean, it's like, well, yes, it is. It absolutely is doing that. Absolutely. And, and, and as I say in the show, in the first episode on Baby Got Back, the, there's a, so when Mick, when Mix was writing it initially, he was very angry, right? Because yeah, his girlfriend yeah. at the time had been shut out uh, from modeling gigs and acting gigs because of her ample, you know, backside. And um, she uh, was Black, Latina, and, you know, just struggling to find work. And he was really frustrated with the, with, with the visuals, the imagery he was seeing in ads, right? And also in in, in the pages of Cosmo magazine, which of course he he sings about in the song. Um, he 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 wrote this song and initially it was supposed to be sort of an, an attack, you know, on on these these unrealistic and, and in his mind unattractive beauty standards. But in writing the in writing the song, he realized it was funny. And and then you know Rick Rubin, um, who was instrumental and in, obviously in, in 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 Mix's rise to fame, um, Rick, you know, the producer, he was. He was like, you got to play this up. You got to play the humor up because that is really what sells this song. These raps are clever. They're funny. They're memorable. And this is what's going to get people to listen. If you have a little fun with it, if you come and you're too aggressive, it may not, it may not resonate as much. So he was really smart to present it as a parody, to present it as, you know, he slipped the commentary, right? He slipped his, his, his sort of, you know, attack on these unrealistic beauty standards into a really, really funny imagery and, and really clever wordplay. And I mean, that's why we're still talking about it 30 years later. As much of an iconic video as it is, and as much as Sir Mix-a-Lot put himself in there making sure that he made the right choice for the right bottom in the, in, in the video, I got I to gotta tell you something, Jason. Maybe it's because I'm here in the South, but, but, but there's some beautiful butts down here now that are much bigger than those butts featured in that video. It's, it's like, it, I don't want to say that it single-handedly sparked a movement, but standards have changed. Yeah, yeah, they and, have. And, I mean, Mix, Mix actually, when we, were, when we were talking about this, his concern was the pendulum has swung the other way. <laughs> <laughs> and that some, some of these women are actually trying to, to get more ample booties. And they're, you know, getting some sometimes dangerous surgery yeah. um, to make that a reality. And, you know, so, so, so that was, he's very, very happy with the progress. Um, and, you know, he doesn't he doesn't say it's all on him. Of course, he knows that there were other other people, you know, who helped make this a reality. Um, you know, women with women, you know, female musicians and, 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 and models and and, 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 and and actresses who actually, you know, had, you know, real bodies, you know, more full figure bodies who also, you know, were in the spotlight and, and helped help push the movement forward. But. You know, he is really, really happy with the progress um, and 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 we can see and hear it everywhere. I mean, I, I would just, you know, toward the end of that episode, I run through a, a whole long list of 
of other songs and other imagery that has, has that has so you know celebrated you know fuller figured you know women uh, and 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 that's that we we talk about it now and it's it's a good thing you know I was doing I was listening to the the this episode um, to kind of give it final sign off and I often do I often do that at the gym obviously a great place yeah, to listen to yeah, podcasts. Yeah. And I'm doing squats, literally I'm doing squats as I'm listening to this episode. And I'm thinking, yeah, this is really motivating. I'm like, got the kettlebell, I'm doing these squats. And I'm like, wow, yeah, we have come a long way. We are all trying to get this, this juicy booty. Like it is, it is, it, we take pride in it. So uh, yeah, so I think, I think it's much, it's much, it's much different now. You know, people are very much in support of that. And, and you really, you see it and you hear it, uh, everywhere yeah the podcast we're talking about is where were you in 92 you also uh I, one of the things that really attracts me to to your podcast is the fact that you have a lot of hooks you have a lot of things and you you tease us in billboard in ways that really keep me listening because i mean first of all i about drove off the road when i found out that that katie lang had an attraction to 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 my girl the you know i mean patsy klein i mean because i mean it was, it was like oh my god but then you know when 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 you when you started talking about what she was wearing and why she wore it and stuff like that it was it was such an oh my god moment because Patsy has been such a huge part of my life. Mm, I love that. I love that. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. I think a lot of listeners, I mean, a lot of my friends who 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 um given me feedback on on that's that's episode two where, where we talk yeah. about Katie Lang and Sophie B. Hawkins and sort of the queer trailblazers of of 1992. And, and and a lot of a lot of listeners, I think, will know Katie Lang really for Constant Craving, which was you know a, a ubiquitous radio single that was her crossover hit. Right, that was when she really became you know a, a pop artist. But she has a whole she has a country backstory that's fascinating, and that, you know she was working in country all through like the mid and late eighties, and 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 trying to you know to kind of break the door down in Nashville and in that industry. And Patsy Cline was really the genesis of that. Patsy Cline was her hero. And she started this band, you know, the Reclines, which was an homage, you know, to Patsy Cline. And she considered herself, you know, cause Katie was crazy. And I mean, crazy in like the best way possible. Like she was just, she was gonna be herself and she was gonna give wild performances. And she considered herself the incarnation you know, of, of, of Patsy Cline. So she was really channeling her style and, and her, her sound, you know, from the beginning. Eventually she moved on from that, you know, specifically when she made the, the, the shift from country music to, you know, more pop music. But Patsy was always a huge, a huge part of her, her life and her performances. And, but it's funny, you, you know, so, so, so Katie was of course really playing with gender Right and and refusing to 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 wear an updo in dresses and and to go for a, you know a, a quote unquote pretty vibe and but I think what a lot of people don't don't necessarily realize and I didn't realize this either because you know I wasn't around for Patsy Cline and I, I I knew her voice I knew the songs but I, right. I wasn't quite sure you know what, how she looked Patsy was doing that too she was wearing cowgirl getups and <laughs> and she wasn't even though you think of Patsy as like you know this quintessential voice of country right and a beautiful female voice I, I don't think people realize that she wasn't necessarily the most demure you know and the most conventionally quote-unquote pretty you know the way that she presented herself she was a little bit more uh she, she 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 played with gender as well and this was long before you know uh Katie was doing it yeah. and long before now we're talking about it a lot people are really like you know just wear what you want to wear and but um, but you know you ha you kind of had to chip away at these things, right? And so you could argue that Patsy was chipping away at this decades ago. You know, one of the one of the things that's very fascinating about that po podcast with uh, Katie Lang and and Sophie B. Hawkins is the fact that I was the morning guy on ninety five point one in nineteen ninety two, and we use Katie Lang and Sophie B. Hawkins as being the alternative. And it really, as oh. as a jock and as as somebody from a station, it was upsetting me that 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 all the other radio stations were starting to jump onto it. And I was like, no, this is our game. Don't don't be playing the songs that we call the alternative. <laughs> I love it, and it's. It's funny because like we think now and like, I mean, you could argue, you could hear these songs on soft rock stations, right? Exactly. So like you could hear these songs on like, I don't know if I'd say AM radio, but maybe. 
I mean, you could argue, you know, you could argue that these were like not alternative songs, but for that time, they really didn't kind of uh, fit the mold, you know, and both, you know, we, t- I, I touched on that in the podcast that Katie's sound was so, that, that album Ingenue, which, you know, Constant Craving was the first single from Ingenue. Ingenue was a bizarre record for the time and people <laughs> didn't know what to make of it. Right. Views were mixed. Because this was not a traditional pop record, right? You remember this era. Like, it was like jazz, and it was cabaret, and it was country, and it was, it was, it had like these, it had, it had like vibraphones, and it had a freaking accordion. Constant Craving has an accordion in it, which, like, an accordion in pop music, to this day, was just, you, as I say in the podcast, maybe five pop songs with an accordion. And, and, and so it was alternative in that sense. People didn't know what to make of it and i think some people were like eh, not my thing i think some people were like well this is just completely cleaning the slate right and starting new with a fresh like sound that you know is it once fresh but also like very very kind of you know old sounding right and and middle eastern sounding and and it, it was just sort of all over the map meanwhile you had sophie b hawkins and 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 i touched on this in the the, the episode as well she was really pushing against one of her producers to not go with a conventional pop and rock sound. He wanted to sand off the edges and make her a little bit more accessible and, and, and give her a more of a mainstream sound. And she really pushed back and she was like, no, I'm Motown, I'm Led Zeppelin. <laughs> I'm like, I'm gonna be rock and soul and I wanna have a unique sound. And I don't care if that you know, means I'm not going to be as famous. I, I have a vision and I want to execute my vision. And they, they they ended up sort of meeting in the middle because you know it, Arrow, like that song, Damn, I Wish I Was Your Lover, ended up becoming, you know, a radio staple. You couldn't escape it. And, you know, it popped up on, I think, Beverly Hills 90210 in a pivotal scene. And, and so that is like one of the classic sort of um, sexy singles, you know, of not only 92, but of the 90s. So, uh, yeah, so you could definitely, I think today, like people would just consider them pop songs, but at that point, I agree. They were, they were, they were breaking the mold. They were certainly quote unquote, you know, alternative, which is an interesting term, right? We don't use that term so much anymore. I'll I'll tell you what, we had to run a disclaimer on our radio station before we played Sophie B. Hawkins, Damn, I Wish I Was Your Lover. And the disclaimer warned parents that we were going to be playing this song. And I thought, what the hell are we doing wrong here? Why are we doing this? But but our program director uh, didn't want to scare off the the, the mothers because, you know, we were 25, 49-year-old women. That was our targeted audience. It, it was the dam, right? It was the use of dam. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah because we you don't say that. I mean, I mean, I I, I thought it was great yeah. when when Hootie and the Blowfish came on because I could finally say Hootie on the air. Yeah, it was it was yeah, and, and and I get into that too. It seems so quaint. Damn, it's like one of the least. It's one of the most innocent, quote unquote. Can we even call it a curse word? One of the most innocent curse words, you know, you can say. It. And we use it to like, we don't use it in a negative way. We use it in a very positive way. Like, you know, damn, that was great. <laughs> you know, damn, like I cannot believe how, you know, amazing that, that, uh, you know, flu soup was. <laughs> uh, it's like, it's like, it's like, uh, it's like, it, but it was crazy at the time. It was, I remember I was very, very young, but I was just blown away by it as a kid because I was like, ooh, that's naughty. You know, it, 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 it was, it was, she, she had to fight her label for that too. She had to fight her label. They did not want her to use that word. And she uses it a lot. It's in the chorus of the song, you know, it's, the, it's, and it's a memorable hook. It's a memorable chorus. So uh, yeah, it's crazy to think that it's crazy to think that, that, that was, uh, that was such a, 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 a controversial you know, moment for, for Dam to to land on the air, but I'm happy she got. I'm happy she got got it through. I'm yeah. happy that they allowed the song to to run on on stations because, again, it, it gave us one of the more memorable singles. You know, of of that decade. Yeah. 1992 was a very tough year for for a lot of mobile entertainers as well because I still remember those days being at high school dances where the world of country music was was on fire, grunge was really on fire, and here came the bump and grind and hip hop, and all of a sudden those gymnasiums never came on the floor together. It was always you had to do it in separate groups. 
Yeah, it's, I mean, I think that's what is really going to blow people away. Um, let's get into the show. I think that people have an impression of the 90s that it was wildly like eclectic and there were a lot of major groundbreaking movements. Uh, for example, like you said, the grunge explosion, the explosion of, of hip hop, in particular West Coast hip hop, That's right? right? The chronic Dr. Dre with, with of course, teaming with, with, with Snoop or Snoop Dogg, putting out the chronic in the fall of that year, major, major moment. Uh, Nirvana's Nevermind had come out in 1991, late 1991, but really uh, they exploded in 92. That's when Smells Like Teen Spirit was climbing the charts and people were really catching on. And yeah, like you said, you had a, actually this week's episode is going to be, is going to tackle um, country music, in ah. particular <laughs> Billy Ray Cyrus um, and how Billy Ray Cyrus managed, managed to infiltrate the top 40 charts yep. with a country song. Um, achy breaky heart and so yeah everything was but, but so we have this impression of these things in the 90s but i don't think people realize all this stuff was happening in 1992 <laughs> yeah. specifically and that is just nuts if you go and you look at i encourage people to do this because it will blow their minds and this is exactly what i did when when i was originating this podcast go to like the top songs of 1992 wikipedia Billboard top songs in 1992, and you're going to just be blown away by how all over the map yep. the charts were that year. And 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 you'll see all the genres we just discussed rubbing up against each other. Plus, you still have some leftover heavy metal stuff. Plus, you still have some adult contemporary stuff. And so it's 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 really it's mind blowing. And 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 there's so much I can't I won't even have time to get into on the podcast. But I try to cover as much ground as possible. But I do think there's something for everyone in that regard because um, there inherently was something for everyone in the music because, you know, there was, there was like, there, there were just countless genres just vying for our attention at that point. Oh my God. You got to come back to the show anytime in the future, Jason, the door is always going to be open for you. Mm. Thank you, Arrow. Well, you be brilliant today, okay? And thank you for sharing the vibe of, of, of music story because we, we don't have Casey Kasem or Dick Clark anymore. And I'm so grateful that, that you are doing this, sir. Oh, thank you so much. Those are, those are, you just mentioned some idols. <laughs> <laughs> well, you be brilliant. Icons. You bet they are. You be brilliant today, okay? Thank you so much. Arrow, have an awesome afternoon.